The sun enters each Old World Florida. Old World Florida. Old World Florida. Dude, I'm telling you, dude. Dr. Narco Longo came on and dropped the hammer of the guy. America's mother, daughter of Atlantis. God sent the weatherman. The devil sent the Spanish. Florida is Eden, the phantom of Newton. Carly is deception. So Florida is the truth. Welcome to Florida, baby. Hope you guys just caught my Texas Forbidden History of Texas video right over there on uh, the video section. But uh, we've got Ben here, the archivist. We've got my buddy Dylan, who was in the Texas video. And um, we're going to be chatting some Texas, some stuff that slipped through the cracks, things that didn't make the cut, and some more hidden mysteries that... Uh, you know, that Ben's going to bring to the table and Dylan's a local. So he's got some, some local gravy and, you know, some other perspectives, you know, he's a box saga guy too. And we've got some ash drinking and cannibalism and stuff that kind of relates to that. Pipe smoking. Pipe smoking in the Texas area, and things like this. But, um, yeah, Ben, how are we doing tonight? <laughs> Good. Good to be here as always. And yeah, we, we talked, we talked about doing this before and I'm glad we waited until there was a, you know, a video you put together where we could dive a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Dylan, how are you doing tonight? I'm well, how are you guys? Great. Chilling. Chilling, chilling. Yeah. <laughs> We're here in the bookstore. I'm standing up now, guys. It feels better. It's more, more chillax, more, yeah. But um, we're gonna talk about Texas. I'm sure we're gonna bring up some articles, but uh, we'll just kind of trace the steps real quick of my trip in Texas. Started out in Florida, came around the Gulf Stream, right? Sorry, not the Gulf Stream. So it came around the Gulf of Mexico, through Louisiana, through New Orleans, then up across into the Texas border. And then Houston right there is the first major city where Dylan's located. And, you know, we got to stay there. He was nice enough, kind enough, super hospitable to us uh, during our time in Texas. So thanks to Dylan, my dude. And, um, yeah, then we went into like more central, it's kind of closer to Austin, San Antonio, the, um, Kerrville is where we were, Kerrville for this astrological conference, Robert Phoenix's shout out Robert Phoenix, right? America's greatest astrologer. 
greatest living astrologer. But um, then we saw the eclipse. So you'll see some great shots of the eclipse in that documentary. Uh, we were all standing there. Dylan was there. He had a obsidian viewing glass, which I hadn't seen up until then. From so Mexico, we got, yeah. We got a chance to peek through that. You want to talk about that a little, Dylan? Uh, that was just a cool little trinket I got down in Mexico. Told to use it on the next eclipse that I looked at by the guy that I bought it from. So we brought it out there and we used it. It was pretty cool. It actually did condense that down. It was much easier to see through. A lot of people in the crowd used it. It's pretty nice. Yeah. And the picture was pretty dang different mm -hmm. from the obsidian to the NASA Goy, Goy goggles mm -hmm. that it seemed almost like in the obsidian, you could see more of the sun. Like there was more light. I feel that through. way as well. It didn't look obstructed. Mm -hmm. Almost Where, like it enveloped around, it came back around. Mm -hmm. Whereas the goggles, you saw like a black blotch. The sun mm -hmm. was blocked out. The sun, it, whatever was in front of it, looked more physical in the NASA goggles. It looked like a actual obstruction. The obsidian had more of like a, I don't know how to describe it, prismatic look to it. Who knows? Ben, you ever hear come across anything like obsidian viewing stones or how they looked at eclipses in ancient times? I have heard that they looked, they used the stones like glasses, but I've never heard they used them to look at the eclipse. But I mean, obsidian writing mirrors were very common in Mexico. Um, in fact, probably one of England's most prized uh, Mesoamerican relics is the scrying mirrors of the Mayans. And uh, Queen Elizabeth had one, and John D had one, mm -hmm. and they all were from uh, the Yucatan. And uh, the stories are pretty crazy. They go, they go from kind of like the crystal ball idea, right? Mirror, mirror on the wall. And um, yeah, only the priests and uh, were allowed to use them, and they smoked all kinds of things through them. But yeah, so first I've heard of them for viewing eclipses. It's a very interesting. Yeah, and interestingly, uh, Dylan, I'd love to know if you had ever heard of this or what the local lore is surrounding this. But in the video, guys, you'll see that one of the tribes whose territory we went through is the Karankawa. Yeah. The Karankawa trace the Gulf Coast from what is it, Galveston to Corpus Christi? Yeah, I was just camping there this weekend, right in the dead center at Matagorda. Mm -hmm. It was all their territory there. A yeah. lot of bird hunting and fishing. Well, Matagorda is famous for a Karankawa mm -hmm. mass massacre. Definitely. Too. And well, we'll we're going to get into you know them. They were tall. They were cannibals. There's all these theories about their origins. But the thing I want to talk about right now is they were sun gazers. They were known sun gazers. They've been observed. They've been reported, recorded. They would stand. I don't know, sit. I don't know, stand or sit. But they would definitely stare at the setting sun. And I'm sure a bunch of other tribes did that. But we know for a fact they did. So. Interesting that it's the setting sun. Mm -hmm. Well, where they were on the Texas coast, being a little bit out into the Gulf, it said, from what I read, it said that where they were, some of them at least, that the sun set into the water. So I, the time of the year right now, I was just there, and I watched the moon rise out of the water and the sun rise out of the water, but it, mm. they both set over the land. Mm. Right. That's what the article said. <laughs> So you're right. I mean, it's it's more easterly, facing out across the Gulf. But they were looking at it. <laughs> Interesting. I wonder where they'd have to be, like what, what part of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, out, out on one of those large breaks, I guess. 
large yeah, enough yeah, that volume. yeah, large enough that the viewable range would just be the kind of an ocean on both sides of them. Maybe Corpus Christi, and they were yeah. looking all the way down into the bay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or Rockport area. Yeah, but the the obsidian thing is really interesting. I mean, you know, they had gods, smoky gods, obsidian gods, gods that were um, contrasted, right? You had Quetzalcoatl, who was the fair god or the white god, and then you had, um, I'm going to murder the name, but it was like uh, Zitlatu, something along those lines. He was called the black one, and... Um, obsidian was the symbolic shining stone used to depict them. And in fact, many of these priests would wear these black obsidian necklaces, whether or not they were mirrors that they would speak into the mirror or they were just representations of this. But you find a lot of overlays with like Krishna and uh, the Brahmin stories of the obsidian and uh, the gods that were related to that. Yeah, the sun gazing on sunset is very interesting. I was just talking to Topher last night about <clears throat> the dielectric adjustment or changeover that happens with the sun. The sun is more of a penetrating ray in uh, in the morning, and then as it breaks overhead, its energy shifts. And um, I wonder if there's something to that to them. Because often, you know, we talked about how reptiles sunbathe in the mornings because the sunlight's actually quite different and it has a much different effect on the bloodstream in the mornings than it does after noon. So. Interesting. You know what, maybe what break chemicals are released or what might happen to us looking or being in the sun in the morning compared to at night? No, I, I mean, I, I'm familiar with all of those things and I, you know, again, just kind of going off my conversation last night, but, you know, melanin is a very, deep subject and melanin is, is has different it's affected differently by sunlight in different parts of the day mm -hmm. so it makes me wonder you know and the interesting the idea that you know the i can't remember the time frame but within 24 hours all the blood in your body goes through your eyes at least once and that sun gazing was like the one of the best ways to purify the blood oh cool yeah. Nice. So, Dylan, what do you know about the Karankawa? Like, um, just, I mean, probably just as not as anyone else. I have a few books on them, but uh, they were tall, as far as I can tell. I know they were in the area, probably in the 14, 1500s recorded. So, who knows how long before they held the territory or what they were before, you know, some of the conquests that we know of. Um, I have heard about pipe smoking. I have heard about some shell mounds, but I don't really think there's that many left. Um, the sun gazing, I haven't really heard that, but we'll have to look into that for sure. It makes sense. They're on the coast as well. I saw a good comment. It's, and it's right up my alley. It's probably a huge stretch, but Quran Kawa, <laughs> were they, were they reading the Quran, <laughs> you know? But a good thing with a good link with their name is they had a nickname, the Kronks, K-R-O-N-K, the Kronks. And Karankawa means lover of hounds or canines, like dog razor, dog people, Karankawa. That's Native American, that's Texas. Then you have in Gaelic, Old Irish, what do you call, what's their word for lover of hounds, lover of canines, dog, man? Concavar. So in Texas, it's Karankawa. And then in Ireland, it's Concavar. Very, very close, aren't they? Very cool. Yeah. The Basque have a very similar description for dog or lover of dogs. Yeah. It's almost the exact same. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of really crazy Gaelic overlays with the Basque language, and the Basque were noted traders in the Gulf. Well, 
that brings us to a good point. We were talking about um, last time you and I talked, I think, Ben, about rabbit people. Mm, a, yeah. leg a legend of red headed, tall, likely light skinned, red headed people on the Texas Gulf Coast. That was a legend that the people in Florida had. They heard stories of a white people with red hair on the Texas Gulf Coast that were rabbit people, they said. I don't know if that means they looked like rabbits or they acted like rabbits, but that was what they called them. Or the rabbit clan, who knows. But this kind of opens up opens up the discussion for the red-headed giants, mm -hmm. which we know was all over America. Yeah, and but after we talked about that, it reminded me of some kind of Irish. I can't remember if it's Irish or Scottish, but the when they describe being rabbit-like, it was often people that lived in caves or that tunneled mm, underground. Good point. And I don't know if that's exactly what they're relating to with this, but in my research and in the discussions me and you have had, most of these red-headed people, again, ochre being a, a pretty blatantly obvious sign that these people weren't accustomed nor melanated enough to survive in the brutal sun they they often were known for dwelling in caves or living underground so when you when you said that yeah it's like not to mention texas is, is full of caves you know the gulf states again you know the closer you get to the to the water it's much more rare but texas has its share of caves and Later in this talk, I'm sure we'll get into the Diabola, the mountain range of Diablo, the Diablo mountain range. And we'll talk more about human sacrifice and some of the crazy shit they found in these caves of that mountain range. I've got the uh, article here about the rabbit people. Can I read that, guys? Yeah. Please. Cool. This comes out of... We're going to see here. I don't know what, oh, the Dothan Eagle, or Dothan, Dothan, Alabama. The Dothan Eagle of Wednesday, August 29th, 1934. Okay, let's get reading. You guys can see that, cool. All right, so this is about bones of a giant found in Florida, and they were just kind of trying to connect it to different legends around America. Silver Springs, evidence of a mysterious race of mound builders inhabiting the peninsula from 2,000 to 5,000 years ago, which in turn has led to varied conjecture as to their appearance and origin. Most pronounced of these theories is that they were white. Indeed, there is a basis for the supposition of a white race in America before Columbus. Aside from Viking and Peruvian Inca legends, that's referring to the Viracocha, interesting. Peru being a Slavic or Viking word, you know, name for Jupiter, Per, mm -hmm. Perun, or Perkins. Um, yeah, and, and Jeru, Peru, Peru Selam. Mm -hmm, that's the it. original Jer Jerusalem was supposed to was supposedly yeah. located in Peru and the endless overlays with Salam, Asalaam Alaikum. Yep. Venice, Suela. Venice, Suela. But uh, reading on, Viking and Peruvian Inca legends are the people described by Lucas Vasquez de Ayon in 1520 as the Duhar. So I've talked about the Duhar in my Hidden Irish History of Ancient America video that was a red-headed group of people in the Georgia, South Carolina area on the coast who had a lot of interesting, unique practices. They would herd deer and milk deer, which was completely unique to them, and also practiced by Celts and people in, in ancient Britain. So. That's just one link. The Duhar occupying a country of the same name along the Florida coast. Now he kind of, there's a little mistake here, not really a mistake, it's true, but just that Florida, you know, Georgia and South Carolina 
in the 1500s were known as Florida. So he's not saying peninsular Florida. It's a little farther north, but still. Yeah. He described them as exceedingly light in color, of gigantic stature, and having abundant hair. Native Americans do not have hair. For the most part, the hair, they don't have leg hair or arm hair. You know, there's exceptions to that, but they tend to be like Asian people. You know, the Mong Mongolian phenotype we see in a lot of the tribes. Those people are very little hair. So that's why he points out the hairiness. They may have been identical with the Ais. The Ais lived around Palm Beach, around Palm Beach County, where I am right now. The Ais. Celtic word. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, Aisa. Yeah. Uh -huh. You just add an A and it's Celtic. The Ais and Tequesta. Also, that's Palm Beach County down to Miami. Rude and fierce tribes inhabiting the East Coast, below Cape Canaveral, whose language was different and who were distinct from the Temucua and Calusa, holding the remainder of the peninsula. The Indians themselves had a legend of a tribe of redheads, known in their own language as rabbit men, residing along the Texas coast. Be that as it may, the Florida remains appear the oldest found so far in the Western Hemisphere and a discovery by workers of the Civilian Conservation Corps in the Ocala National Forest, a few miles east of Silver Springs, sheds new light upon the family life of, the, of this people of the dawn. He calls them people of the dawn because they were known as the children of the dawn, the Abenakis from uh, the Northeast, who, who claimed they came from the Northeast, not from the Bering Strait. Similar to the Micmac. What's up, Micmac? What do you got? To, you know, ladle us a little gravy in the comments about uh, the Algonquin, Abenaki origins, you know, giants connections to Europe. Well, but, and, but, you know, we were talking mm -hmm. about Gog and Magog before we went live. And he was just mentioning it. Caucasian, Gogasian. Wow, that's a good one. That's another Phoenician situation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Where where Finn is F I N, the most phonetic language in the world. Why is it? And the concept of phonetic means one letter equals one sound. Why is the word phonetic so unphonetic? P H O sometimes an E like Phoenician. That's the unphonetic. Finn is phonetic. F I N. Same mm -hmm. with Caucasian. C A U C but it's pronounced almost like an O and a G, isn't it? Yeah, and you look into King Og, it's, that's also a deep rabbit hole that ties in with what we were talking about before we went live, tracing that lineage again to kind of this idea of the King of Kings, this Prester John, as many people know him, the land of Cathay, Cathay, um, and the Alexander stories and Gog and Magog really, again, being here, North America-ish. But yeah, keep going with the article. Yeah, just to finish this one out. An ancient tragedy involving an American Aboriginal group or family has been disclosed in a burial chamber estimated to be more than 2,000 years old. Discoveries, uh, I guess it cuts off there. Doesn't matter. But it goes on a bunch of articles about the same discoveries near Silver Springs. Talks about two different races living side by side in Florida. One having a total like Nordic, you know, facial type, head type, skull shape. Tall, six foot tall woman with a fully, you know, bulbous head, like well developed. Then there was a low browed Shorter, might have been the same size, but for a man as big as the woman, if not shorter, he had a lower brow type, completely different race, almost like a different species. It was so distinct. They had pictures, there's pictures, here we'll show, 
I'll show the pictures. But whatever. Let's talk about Texas. What else? Let's. Yeah, what, what do you got on the uh, the agenda? What's on the bulletin that you queued up for Texas? Well, since we talked, you know, and again, time is of the essence, so I'll try to be as efficient as I can. But yeah, we talked about sacrifice a little bit, so there's something that I wanted to mention, and we mentioned mounts. Um, and Texas had had again keyword as as Dylan was describing as well. You know, Texas has had most of its mound completely mounds completely wiped off the map. Um, but some of the mounds in Texas were crazy. They were very much unlike the mounds that we're familiar with on the Mississippi Valley and the Missouri Valley. And uh, one of my favorites is a uh, it's an article from 1861, and it's called "A Mound of Skulls." And I'll just kind of read this one here. Um, it is reported that near Carrizo Springs, Texas, oh, an oval-topped mound covered with petrified human skulls has been discovered. This is something that you found all through Mesoamerica and even into the Peruvian areas. Mm -hmm. These obelisks were covered in skulls, and they found weird sacrificial altars that were covered in human skulls. So here we have a mound that's covered in petrified human skulls. The mound is circular in form and about 100 feet high. And on one side is joined to a short range of hills of about the same height. Now, again, it doesn't go on to say they excavated the hills, but I'm assuring you this is some kind of a building that's been covered by earth, like most of these mounds have been. On the summit... And for some distance down the sloping side, it is covered with what appear to be smooth spherical bones, which upon close examination proved to be, it is said, petrified human skulls, mm -hmm. distorted into grotesque shapes. Ooh. It is further stated that by removing the loose dirt and sand from the orifices of the face, the unmistakable human continence is revealed. Bones of other classes are also said to be found there and form all appearances. The whole mound is formed of human skulls. Yeah, and these images that you're sharing here um, are quite provocative. It kind of goes in, in line with some of these um, underground, um, you know, vaults, so to say, under a lot of these Eastern European churches. Um where they have millions and millions of skulls, you know, Paris being one of the most obvious examples with 4 million, I believe, 4 million sets of human skulls and bones. But yeah, mounds like this were found all over the place, and it makes you wonder. Like, have you ever seen the vulture pits, Longo? I don't think so. So they would dispose of thousands of human bodies in these circular pits, kind of like this guy was describing here. Um, and they would just be like a concrete circle full of human bodies sitting out in the sun, and the, the, the whole concrete thing would be lined with vultures. And these images are found all over the world in the 1800s, so it makes you wonder where are all these bodies coming from, right? We've talked about the labor shortage in the 1800s, but there's no lack of finding images like this where there's just literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of human bones piled up or found underground or whatever the, the the relation may be but yeah quite an interesting thing that one's pretty nuts um i think i've i mean longo and i've talked a little bit about mounds and death rites and maybe some we we really maybe we don't know but um some of these mounds may have been built because they were trying to track a previous death rite or way of disposing of a body properly. And when I see these mounds with all the bones, what I instantly think is they're overwhelmed with the death and they don't seem to be getting the uh, results that they were trying to achieve. So it's morphed into something else. And sometimes we see that with other um, parts of sacrifice, especially in Mexico. You know, it evolves out. Uh, you have too many people in the area, so you start to sacrifice as well. That's that's one thing, you know. So there, there's a lot of uh, indication of that. Feast or famine. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it, again, studying the, you know, the Kalevala or, you know, the Bach saga or some of these other, you know, texts that supposedly go back, you know, as far as human stories have survived, you know, often the story goes sacrifice started as what the first fruits or the first grains or something similar to that. And as you mentioned, the results no longer were being obtained and morphed into this perhaps more m- morbid mm-hmm. uh, representation of sacrifice. Also, a good thing to note here is that consuming dead loved ones seems to be the common thread here. Mm-hmm. You, ha- you have, you know, different types of cannibalism in different continents. But what we have here in Texas and is what I like to call, you know, the gentleman's cannibalism. Uh, anthropo- anthropophagy, let's call it, you know, nice sounding, but they s- would not eat out of hunger in Texas. They wouldn't cannibalize people out of hunger. And then another guy came through the Karankawa territory, the tribe we were just talking about and said, well, <clears throat> you know, I didn't see any cannibalism. This was a guy who lived among them for years. I didn't see any cannibalism, but I saw them drinking their dead loved one's ash in water. Now that should prick the ears of anyone familiar with the Bach saga, um, because they're kind of missing a step. They're Mm. like, they're like skipping a (laughs) step, you know, like they, they burnt their loved ones. They've got the ash. And in the Bach saga, the story out of Finland that we've been referencing, that says this is the origin of the ash tree, the name ash, they would put the ash of their loved ones into a familial family tree, typically the ash tree. Then they would take the leaves from this tree, make tea, and they're thereby, you know, keeping it within the family, so to speak. And when you, anyone out there who knows about cell salts, there's something to this. If there's anything a tree can absorb from a dead body, it's the cell salts in their bare, most fine, you know, components. You have the cell salts easily being swallowed up by the soil, easily being swallowed up through the roots, you know, through wet soil. It's easy. It's, you know, it's not rocket science. And then by drinking that, they believe not only they're strengthening their vril, their chi, you know, their e, whatever you want to call it, they were also, this is unspoken, this isn't explicitly said in the Vox Saga, but you're getting a hefty dose of cell salts, and you're going to be healthier. Um, At some, you know, some of these cell salts are, in fact, most of the cell salts they're not wacky compounds. They're things people already take as supplements, a lot of them. One of them is silica. So a lot of people out there take silica for healthy nails and hair. And... But yeah, this is the ash tree thing. So the Karankawa, did they learn this from someone? Did they, you know, did they get a quick layman's explanation and then 100, 100 years later they, they're missing the crucial part, which is the ash tree? but they're still trying to you know operate under this ancient system and they're just skipping a step taking the ash drinking it see these are the things that are isn't easily typed up in the script of my video but is a lot better discussed you know out in the open because it's pure speculation you know what i mean so that's why i'd love to get these two guys's takes on that is what's with the karankawa drinking the ash dylan you go first i i agree with that i agree with your assessment when we're uh speculating here they are missing a step but they're trying to keep it alive and that's what i see commonplace in uh, north america south america central america um after the conquest with whatever's still left here um you know what's ever been left left standing so we, we see these common little threads and i think you're right you're onto something there yeah, I mean, ben. 
I've heard the same stories. You know, we've talked a lot about trees being planted on top of mounds or on top of burial chambers, right? We've talked about the oak tree was one of the most common. Um, but one only need to look at the root words of cement and cemetery. And a lot of tribes were taking ash. They were making vases out of it. And they would drink the water from the vase, a similar type of ritual to what we're describing here, where they were just drinking the ash. Many cultures, especially Asian cultures, would make porcelain from ash of family members, and they would make some kind of vessel, primarily drinking vessels, from my experience. Um, but yeah, cemetery, cement, ash, the roots are all there. And the obsession with ash and cremation, and of course the box saga, but that that type of ritual is found on all continents. And they're all missing a little bit of the kind of original touch or however you want to describe it. But so it's not too surprising. It's kind of weird that they're drinking the actual ash. From what I've seen, mostly they're creating some kind of a an idol or a vessel from the ash. But yeah, again, the we've talked about mortar, pestle, cement, the root word for cement is is to slay or to fell. And then you get the kind of the same roots from cemetery and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Also cemetery, Kemet, Kemet, you know, that's spelled with a C for a reason on this. Mm -hmm. The C can go hard and you get Kemet, but also the black, know, black cement. Kemet, the land of Kem is black which is the same root i believe it, the same root exists in cemetery yeah pitch another word for cement was pitch before we think of modern cement you know pitch is always of course a black kind of swampy <clears throat> yeah speaking of pitch black and swampy what's up jimmy stingray how we doing tonight <laughs> jimmy Perfect good to segue. see you again. Good evening, gentlemen. Fascinating discussion as always. I'm trying to pull up some images of the, the drink here. It's hard Jimmy, to find. Jimmy Stingray himself. Search uh, search drinking human ash. Oh, very nice. direct. Yep. <laughs> you gotta We're gonna... you gotta you gotta speak Chinese to Google. That's right. Um, I'll probably pull up some TLC show about like, I'm addicted to, yeah. What did I, what did I say? Eating my yep. husband's ashes. I can't stop it. It he just it's tastes like, so good. How is it that predictable? But that's, I knew that would come up first and no Karankwa at all. No. Uh, an Indian tribe, uh, his Bill Gates. See, no one's broken this, but you doctor no one's mm. touched the the uh dead person drink i love it yeah for real yeah because bill gates is he's you know he's uh rolling out that poop water remember he drank that poop water and like right. a ted ted talk <laughs> yeah right here <laughs> yeah. yeah he's he's like i uh, love it yeah there it is <laughs> oh my god he's, he's into he's he's into sick stuff he's got yeah. weird fetishes he likes to drink the caca <laughs> the fucking weirdo but um yeah the ash you know show Common of thumbs thumb, show of oranges in the in the chat guys if you eat ash out there who eats ash cool gonna, and jimmy we need <laughs> that's going on the merch list okay uh, it's <laughs> gonna be i eat ash <laughs> Yeah, and just a, an image of a Karankun warrior with a little smirk, a little glint in his eye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a great t-shirt, folks. We'll get cooking. I'll, uh, I'll get over to the factory and get the elves working on that. Yeah. Staff. Amen. By elves, I mean uh, new, new Americans that have just arrived. <laughs> No, yeah. just kidding. <laughs> Mayan, our Mayan craftsmen. That's right. Mayan descendants. 
Yeah. But let's see. What else? What else was unique? You had a lot of tattooing going on with the uh, Texas natives. Okay. You had a lot of piercings going on with the Texas natives. That was another thing. They had big labrets in the bottom lip. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they fucked their face up pretty weird. You want, these guys would have been terrifying to come across in real life. Yeah, scarification. They did yes. as well. That's an, I didn't touch on that in the video. I should have because it's, it's, it was super sketchy. They would scar, cut like geometric patterns across their body, like initiation rites, you know, t like a tattooing alternative, but they'd be tattooed, cut up like, like some of these prison, you know, prison, uh, get ups, like some of these countries do where they cut, they shave the skin instead of tattooing. Mm. And they were, and they were tattooed and they had elongated skulls. So the longest skull I've ever heard of comes out of the Caddo or Tula people of Northeast Texas. And they said, they swore in La Florida del Inca, they came into Texas, the DeSoto expedition, and you know, 1539 around there ish. I don't know, somewhere around there. They went into Texas, I don't know, 1540, somewhere around there. Don't, don't quote me on that. Go look it up. They went into Texas and met the, the Caddo people, who was kind of like a larger group, umbrella group. And then they came across the Tula. And the Tula, remember, these were Spaniards with Inca soldiers going into America with Incas from Peru who were totally familiar with elongated skulls. If anyone's familiar with, with elongated skulls and cranial deformation, it's the Peruvians who were serving on this expedition alongside DeSoto because he just, he just went through Peru and took over. Then they went to Florida. So there's Inca soldiers, Spaniards, they encounter the Tula, and what do they say? Well, in La Florida del Inca, they say their heads were a full yard's length. Full yard. Now, someone has pointed out that the Spanish yard then was shorter than our modern yard. But it's still 32 inches instead of 36. That's still longer than any of the Paracas skulls, any of the skulls in Bolivia or Peru, you know, or anywhere that I've seen. Now, we don't have pictures of those, but we know they were living, breathing, fighting, you know, right up next to the Peruvians who knew what elongated skulls looked like. They didn't have a reason to exaggerate that. But we know they were t terrifying in appearance. What do you guys think? You want to tee off on the elongated skull? Oh, well, I mean, you again, know? talking about phonetics and overlays, and Tula comes from Thule, mm. same root. So you got the Hyperborean overlays, right? Because the Arctic land was Tula or Thule. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's not surprising to me again that a lot of these. You know, even the Peruvians said they came from the north, you know. And then when we talk about, which we already mentioned earlier, the kind of Viracocha, Quetzalcoatl, uh, Bach saga <laughs> overlays here are kind of endless, right? You know, so when you hear, when I hear you say Tula, I just hear Tule or Tool or yeah. the Thule. Again, the Thule Society, right? There's still a group of what we would think of as Eskimo or Inuit that consider themselves the Thule people and, mm -hmm. you know, touching on kind of our Micmac brother here in chat. Um, they, they had ventured all the way into the Iroquois and kind of had correspondence with one another. <clears throat> but yeah, it's just the same roots. It's all going back to the same roots. Perfect. Jimmy. You, just, you just look up Tula American native American people and what do we find on the on the front page? Sir, a big Jake, old head. Sir Jake Rothschild himself. Yeah. <laughs> the Call the, me Jay. Call me Jay Roth. Yeah, the, yeah. The melanated millionaire himself. <laughs> the the secretly melanated. 
He owns it. He owns it all. Yeah. Mm. He's a brainiac. You know. Wow. If he was falling, he could perhaps hook his head. If he's, you know, if there was a branch, he could just hook on. It's, it's almost like an extra feature and, yeah. and uh, hang there like that. Dylan, what do you, what, what pops into your head when you think of elongated skulls, especially in Texas? Uh, speciation. I mean, I'm, I'm heavy into the box saga. So what I'm thinking about the whole time when you guys are talking about this is the cutoff from whenever the last cutoff was between uh, the North and the other kingdoms. Uh, what happened when they all started to breed together? Um, I'm, I'm familiar with, there's quite a few elongated skulls that I, I know that are in private collections that have been found in North American mounds. But most of them are Mississippian, as far as I as far as I know. I haven't heard too many more south into Texas, but Cotto is pretty close to all that, so I, I've heard of a few of those. Got some big old uh, gauges in the house. Yeah, uh, upright, big old plates, and that's you know when we see that we think Africa, right? With those mm -hmm. Kenyan plates yeah, Bor in the Borneo. That's all oh, yeah. over. Wow. Okay, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Here, it's let's stones. In that's it. the scarification stuff too. The yorba. I did. A, I did a video a while back on the yorba North African tribe, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean their their historical definition. And again, they were known for scarification, and they had these masks that they put on during their ceremony, and they were very quote Asiatic, Mongol high cheek, oddly shaped, wow. and uh, not what we would consider African. They looked nothing like the Yorba people. And the Yorba had a similar story, again, to the Berbers and the Basque, that they came from a land just like the Egyptians, the Red Land to the West. Ooh, interesting. We know and, for... And we... Longo, you know what there's... Their priest, the the staff he he used in ceremony, looked exactly like the trident, Dang. and they said that their god, their main god, was the god of the water, and it was wow. just exactly Neptune overlays. Wow, very very Atlantean. Pretty crazy. We're gonna get here to some Mississippian. These are some Mississippians, and you know that would include Florida down into Florida. They had opper, sorry, not, they had copper. They had armor. They mm -hmm. had helmets, breastplates, clubs, yeah. clubs that were so well-crafted that our machining presses couldn't make some of these out of the stones they find in yeah. the Southeast United States. Yeah, we, they, they had copper that was, that loved, the, the way it was tempered was so advanced we can't even do it today. Yeah. Well, cold hammered. They, mm -hmm. they could pull it out of the Great Lakes area in its final form, which is very unusual. They could pull copper out raw with such a high purity that it yeah, could it was, be sh shaped. It was still soft, yeah. Yeah. Since we, we're talking about advanced weaponry, again, I'm going to kind of use whatever opportunity I have to jump in with some of the material I can share. And this is one of my favorite articles of all time. And it comes from Texas and it's about incredible advanced weapons found in Texas that defy explanation. So this one is called um, unearthing an old burial ground of Indians and Aztecs. And this is from 1889. A discovery of immense archaeological interest has recently been made near a painted cave on the Southern Pacific Railroad about the junction of Picos and the Rio Grande. Mr. Vandervoort, who owns a farm near the town mentioned, found on his place after a recent windstorm a large cottonwood tree blown down and leaving the roots exposed. In the earth loosened by its fall and upheave, upheaval, and its spreading roots, he noticed a round object, which upon inspection proved to be a human skull. The skull was that of an Aztec. After two or three feet had been removed, almost every upheaval of the spade brought to light a bone or a weapon or another object. There was a great number of arrowheads, both of stone and of glass. 
in the manufacture of which the Aztecs mm. excelled, but to set at rest all doubts as to what the bones had belonged to, the peculiar weapon of the Atslan race was found. This weapon is a short metal axe with blades of glass. The metal is supposed to be copper, wow. but the specimens are varnished and encrusted by age and burial. Several shields are among the relics, and on being cleaned were found to be of brass, each skillfully engraved with an owl. Okay, the owl is really important mm. when we get into like the the religious yep. rites and kind of the overlays yep. again, the roots of it all. Canaanite sacrifice and Min Minerva Bohemian Grove. Yep. Yeah, the Minerva owl, right? That's a huge one everywhere. Uh, but it gets better. Copper knives and stone tomahawks are abundant, and there are 20 or 30 headbands of silver and copper. There is mm. also a helmet or cacique of thin silver with a hole in the top. The headdress of a Mexican officer was a helmet with a top knot of feathers. Silver armor, legs from knees to ankle, was found. Near the helmet skull, helmeted skull, one bony hand still clinched a dart with three copper points and held it so firmly that it was necessary to keep the hand in all. Another ghastly object was a pair of clinched jaws holding beneath their discolored teeth a small image engraved on agate. This must have been the likeness of a god thrust into the mouth. A number of gold and silver pendants and a quantity of Aztec currency were picked up. The latter consists of bits of tin in the shape of the letter T. Among the human bones were mingled those of several animals, too small to have been cattle or horses, of course unknown, and too large to have been dogs. So in another video, which we won't have time to get into, they found another king who was slain in battle, and he was fighting with two giant cats. So this is a story that has been kind of thrown around as myth that some of these men went into battle with large cats. And here's exactly basically what he's saying, that this there were large cats fighting this war with these two opposing tribes and were slain next to this this uh, these people in the, in the ground here. They were, they were those of ocelots trained by the Aztecs for the hunt and for battle. That the ocelots took an active part is shown by the fact that the jaws of one held the severed skull of an Indian, while the teeth of a second were fastened on the thigh bone. In turn, a tomahawk was sticking in his partially cloven skull. This is sick. Oh my God. They were, Where so is that on, article from? They were fighting against... Ex were they fighting against them, or did they, like... Two both, tribes is basically what he's saying. They were use using them in them. war. That's insane. That's sick. Yeah. But the again, wow. since we mentioned the warfare, the advanced weaponry, the glass mixed with metal is a high, high art. Actually getting those two to adhere to each other and and not disrupt the actual function of the weapon is very difficult. So to hear you have these mixture of not only copper but brass mixed with hardened glass is pretty nuts. And again, the silver legs like a like a knight. They had silver leg mm -hmm. silver armor from knee to ankle. Mm -hmm. And uh but yeah, the ocelot part is crazy. I've found Again, the one I mentioned earlier was a man found with two of them. And this man was like close to eight feet tall. So not your typical, quote, Aztec or Mayan who were well, closer to five and a half feet. You see some of those feet. old Assyrian, like, reliefs, and they, yeah. they're... Holding the big cats. Mm -hmm. uh oh, did I? Okay. So, oh, there he is. <laughs> I cut out. You I cut out, was, yeah. Yeah, it was just me. You're, broke, you're back. Um, you see some of those old Mesopotamian reliefs of like ancient deities, and they're holding, they're literally, they've got lions in headlocks, mm -hmm. like they're the size of mini Yorkies. Yeah, like that. And there are lions with manes, like, you know, baby lions don't have manes. Full grown lion, dude standing something like 20 feet tall holding the lions. 
Mm-hmm. See if you can search that, Jimmy. Giant. Mm-hmm. I think it's an Assyrian statue, just Mesopotamian. Giant lion giant cat. statue. I think so, yeah, maybe. Where was that article from, Ben Ben? That was incredible. Which uh, region? D- 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 well, it's in Texas. In Texas, yeah. oh. Yeah, it was near the Rio Grande. Uh, but the article is from a Washington newspaper from 1889. Wow. And you've that's in a video that you've made? Yep, that's from my Anomalous America episode on Texas. On Texas, great. Great, mm-hmm. wow. One of my favorite episodes. I didn't even get to use like a tenth of my material, and it's almost two and a half hours long. Thing. Texas had a ton of stuff. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Hey, James. Could you search word for word giant holding lion statue? That should bring it up. Thank you. I wonder, just reading, just hearing the description of that weaponry. Is it here? Oh, this one? Yeah. Um, you, know the, you know the Black Panther movie, the, the most recent one, where it's kind of the two opposing factions? Is the kind of quote Aztecs or the Mayans fighting with this uh, quote African tribe? The technology, I think, is that that movie is more similar to what I think war was actually like at this time. But yeah, there's that's a, that's a great statue. Sixteen foot statues. Wow. We was lion tamers, boy. <laughs> we was taming lions and shit. Yeah, and you know the big cats of of Africa and India. They the oldest examples come from America. Yes, the, the oldest fact. horses, the oldest oldest horses, the oldest camels, the yep. oldest big cats. They all come from the Americas. Yep, cheetah, lion. Go look it up. It's a fact. Direct descendants come from the Americas. They disappeared in the Ice Age and appeared in Eurasia. Mm-hmm. That's where you get the cheetah, lion, camel. And the horse. The horse alone is the huge dead giveaway with the Noah's Ark story. Absolutely, yeah. And they were still found in the Americas in the 1800s. In fact, a gentleman found a lion, not a mountain lion, a lion, African stylized, as we would think of them, in a cave system protecting her young in Arizona in the Mm. 1800s. (laughs) Wow. So big, big cats were lions as we think of them. African stylized, that dark tan color or bright tan, light tan, were still found in the Americas in the 1800s. Well, it makes sense with the terrain being what it is in Texas. You can imagine lions running around being very, um, having food, being very uh-huh. healthy at home. Yeah. I believe this makes sense. There, There's different size mountain lions or puma in America as well. Texas mm-hmm. to Arizona, I have a place in Arizona as well. They're different size than here in Texas. And yeah. I think even different than in Florida. And what that reminds me of is speciation. If there's not that many lions left being hunted out, they're going to be forced to adapt and mate into another genus and mountain lions there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Interesting, interesting angle here. The Seminoles had a word for bobcat. Like they knew what a bobcat was. Mm -hmm. They knew what a cougar was. And they had words for bobcat, word for cougar. Then they had a word for tiger, and one of their clans was the tiger. <laughs> this was not, oh, well, I shouldn't say that for sure, but they were known as the tiger. It might have been a family, it might not have been a clan, but they used tiger despite having a word for bobcat and cougar. They had a different word for tiger that they used. And there's no tigers in Florida. Yeah, striped. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, kind of off subject and not Texas related, but I did a video on monsters and there was a tiger striped, they called it the pygmy eater in Borneo. And this thing was like 25 feet tall and it was eating pygmies in Borneo. It was literally coming in to pygmy villages, swiping over their huts and pulling them out alive it was called the Cacique or the Gazique. Wow. And, um, it's a big chief. They hired, they hired big game hunters from Britain to come kill it. Uh, 
Jimmy's dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Took it out. But, but yeah, so this kind of, again, as Dylan was mentioning, shit was crazy, you know? Again, when we talk about the box saga and, you know, you know, everyone knows me and Longo aren't afraid to get Tolkien on everybody here, but um, the earth was populated with some weird ass shit before mm. the Ice Age and some of it survived, whether it went underground. Obviously, the higher population of things that survived this would be in the tropical regions where, where obviously things didn't change so much. Mm-hmm. But... Um, but yeah, just imagine uh, what was once roaming <laughs> the earth, especially here in America. Uh, it's quite a shocking environment, to say the least. I mean, as me and Longo have talked about, the 30 foot alligator, you know, that's small. Mm-hmm. You know, that's big now, but there were ones far larger. And, and again, the. The weather, Pat, the the change in climate was drastic because these 30-foot alligators have been found all the way up into um, Connecticut and and New Jersey. In fact, they were building a building in the 1800s in New Jersey, and 30 feet down, they found – or 12 feet below the surface, they found a 30-foot alligator. Wow. Alive? No, 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 no. Right. The skeleton. <laughs> so, so guys, Jimmy, if you could pull up the Patreon page just real quick, it's a good oh, yeah. opportunity. Guys, I don't know if you guys knew. Every thirty seconds, a pygmy American <laughs> loses their life to a Titanic alligator. Um, <laughs> sign up, donate to the Old World Florida Patreon, <laughs> and you can adopt from afar. Donate and foster your own American pygmy. They're there. They're still alive. They're not extinct. They're hiding behind the rocks, behind the leaves. They're waiting for our our invitation. They're waiting for us to, to stand up and protect them. So the American pygmies will come back. They will emerge from the forest with open arms if we get the old world Florida. if we get the old world florida <laughs> patreon up to i don't know what we're at. it doesn't matter just a certain just, amount to make them feel safe from the yeah. big cats <laughs> yep the guys these guys are they like cold hard cash i'm gonna give it to you straight okay <laughs> they want money it. the cranes are protected but the pygmies are not we need to bring the you know we gotta bring the crane numbers down that war is still right. going on way too long yep exactly Guys, this is a war. Guys, support. <laughs> the New Yorkers who run the show have been bending over a barrel, doing everything they can for the endangered wading birds in Florida. Okay, these are the mm. enemy. These are the nemesis. Okay, these guys migrate back and forth to South America. South America. Okay, they don't belong in Florida. They're scaring away the pygmies. Pygmy lives matter, guys. Okay. <laughs> so go donate. Remember these pygmies, they like they like the money. I don't like money. They want some, they want money. It's all going to them. Because they got... need new hut. <laughs> their, their huts are all scratched up and uh you guys, know, it's yeah. My girlfriend's my girlfriend's fingernails <laughs> have been worn out from crafting crafting troll houses in the woods for the yep. pygmies to come live in right. weaving reeds and threading yep. sticks together for these little guys you've okay. got to save them moving on we'll work guys we'll update you next episode with the uh, pygmy battle race for the pygmy survival but speaking of wild animals and creatures in florida who saw the tiger king series right or lying. Mm-hmm. What was the name? Tiger King. Netflix. Tiger yeah. King. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Tiger King on Netflix. That guy. Um, I don't remember his name. Uh, the film man, if you guys know it. Tiger King no grew up in Florida, partially. When he got into his bad car accident or whatever, he went down to Florida, and stayed next to Lion Country Safari, and the people would bring lions and tiger cubs back to him and that's how he got into you know big cats 
but Joe Exotic. Learned, Joe Exotic, thank you. He learned the tricks of the trade down here in Florida. Like every good safari farmer should. Go on down to Florida, let them teach you what you need to know, then go set up your own, you know, mega, mega zoo, theme park, whatever. This is in Palm Beach County, like right down the street from where we are. Pretty crazy. This is where, this is where he was living right next door to. Some interesting links, you know, could be stretch, could be a stretch here, but Florida has the largest elephant, like non-native elephant herd of anywhere in the world. Florida. So, you know, they're native to, to parts of Asia. They're native to Africa. But for places that they're not native, Florida has the largest herd of elephants somewhere in central Florida. Why? Because they're all the disposed of or, you know, retired, you could say, retired circus elephants from the Ringling Circus, which was headquartered in Florida. Now, the circus had a whole lot of, you know, motives, agendas behind it with uh, deconstruction and mocking of the Moorish Empire. Say what you will, but, you know, the, the monkey dancing in the fez hat, that was a, <laughs> that was a directed, you know, insult. And all the African, so-called African animals, let me get rid of this, so-called African animals, Jimmy, you're going back down there, might be, bro. Uh, all the African animals being in the circus also happen to be Confederate staples, like Confederate logos. You have the elephant, the camel. Um, these are today would transform into your mascots of the Southeast United States. Why has Alabama got the elephants? You know, where are the um, different animals? Jaguars in Florida, for example. You know, elephants in Alabama. What are they trying to tell us? Florida is the richest fossil place in the world in terms of uh, elephants. Mastodon, mammoth, Colombian. They weren't hairy. They were just like an elephant. So there's a link here. I've had done a couple videos on this, but I know you got to go in a little bit here soon, but any, you want to touch on any of the animals, the big animals, things being in America, not supposed to be, et cetera. Ben. Yeah. Yeah. I'll kind of just, uh, yeah, because it's, I got to get going. Um, if you're still going, I got to get the kids down. If you're still going, I'll come sit back down, but yeah, I'll just kind of fast forward through some of my stuff here. Um, one of my favorites, one is uh, uh, an article from 1871. Gatesville, Texas is excited over the appearance of an immense orangutan in its vicinity. The animal is described Whoa. as being seven feet high and covered from head to toe with a thick coating of hair. Its eyes shine like fire. It boasts a double row of teeth. Jesus. And when last seen, it had one hand on a large crooked stick, Oof. and under the other uh, arm was a young calf, apparently Oof. just killed. What was it Sarah and, Jessica Parker? <laughs> uh, a hunting party has been organized to capture or kill the monster. This is kind of a post I made a long time ago about uh, early examples of uh, what we would call Bigfoot. Whoa! In Dude. another article, they described it as orange. So it had it was a giant orange-colored, uh, seven-foot-tall orangutan. Wow. It was hunting. They, radioactive, a radioactive X-Men glowing eye, <laughs> yep. eye glow, yeah. alcoholic yep. Down syndrome orangutan, <laughs> or yeah. red-headed rabbit people. Rabbit people. Those were the hairy people that they were talking about. They mentioned the Red hair. as well. They didn't say facial hair. They just said very hairy. And yeah, so again, sticking with the animals for now, this is another one from um, 1870s. In Stonewall County, Texas, again, Stonewall County, the petrified skeleton of a monster whale was discovered a few days ago. It is described as being perfect in shape, 
but has been converted into the hardest kind of rock. The skeleton can be easily traced for about 100 feet, but is believed to be much longer than that. Some count, some contend that it's not a whale, but a giant lizard that existed in former ages, supposed to be as big as a meeting house and as long as a railroad train. No, that's just that's just one of them Texas girls, boy. That's just one of them big old Jeez. Dallas girls. Long as a train, she is. Wow. So yeah, for the sake of uh, getting a, a lot of these good ones out that I have not covered before, uh, here's another one that's a favorite of mine. Gold in Texas. The Houston Telegraph says that the preparations are in progress in all parts of the state for a grand expedition to the gold region that has been discovered in northern Texas, not far from the ruins of the celebrated city of Grand Quivera. So kind of the near the panhandle part. Immense excavations are shown along the foot of the mountains and the ruins of vast cities indicate that these mines were once worked by millions of people. The geographic mm. formations of this region are similar to those of the gold regions of California. Mm -hmm. And yeah, my California episode is insane. Um, when they were doing their uh, hydro mining, which is where they just take a giant water jet and basically wash away whole mountains. Um, that's when they found skeletons of horses that were over 40 feet tall with saddles Whoa. on their backs. So imagine, you know, yeah, um, and since we were talking about a little, we talked about Galveston off air a little bit, um, lost race of Texas. This is from the late 1800s, a prehistoric city near Galveston engulfed by a tidal wave. Relics of a prehistoric race were uncovered in Galveston, Texas, just previous to the storm that flooded the entire city, nearly 2,000 human skeletons have been found. So this is under Galveston today. They were doing excavations for uh, new buildings, and they uncovered that all of Galveston was built on top of a previous race that had been hit by a tidal wave, essentially, and they found over 2,000 inhabitants. Uh, excavations just given give the opinion that an ancient city had been submerged by a tidal wave that drove all the inhabitants, that drowned all the inhabitants centuries ago. The bones were discovered in search for relics for archaeological exhibit at the Pan American Exposition, which is to be held in Buffalo. The skeletons are beyond a doubt several thousand years old, and the character of the people who occupied the coast of the Gulf in this period is as interesting as a subject of speculation. Whomever they have, may have been and wherever they may have gone, the remains found show beyond question that some terrible outbreak of nature caused the sudden death of thousands. That goes on and on. You can see that one in my, in my Anomalous America episode, but since we wanted to since we touched on mounds a little bit, I have probably just time for one last one here. <clears throat> and this is called a Texas Wonder. This is from 1893. And this is a mound they found. And it turned out to be a whole city. An important discovery recently made in Wise County, a prehistoric pavement of petrified wood supposed to have been constructed by the mound builders of an extinct race. So I'm going to paraphrase this one because it's really long. The pavement consisted of petrified wood covering the summit of a mound one and a half acres in area. Samples of the pavement were brought to Garveland of Cleveland, Ohio, who made the following statement. The mound is 60 feet high, square shaped with sloping sides, so pyramidal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, the top covered an acre and a half and a petrified pavement of was struck under which appeared to be a shallow deposit of drift. Further exploration showed that the entire summit of the mound was paved. The petrified blocks were laid on ends as compactly as Nicholson pavement and were perfectly smooth. The mound, which was constructed with mathematical precision, also contains blocks of stone. The samples of the pavement are four inches long and undoubtedly wow. of petrified wood and contained high amounts of silica. Hmm. 
Um, the blocks give evidence of having been split by a sharp instrument and sawed at the upper surface. While thousands of mounds have been discovered on this continent, this is the only one in which, through the agency of petrifaction, nature has embalmed an evidence of a place and civilization occupied by the mound builders far in advance of what has been recorded. Because this, this was different groups. So again, as you get farther up the Mississippi and into the Missouri, the mounds shape, style, they change. And the closer, again, you get to the Gulf, they tend to get more advanced. Um, and again, that not all of these were burial mounds. Many of these were actually buildings. And this one's, as he described, uh, basically a perfect pyramid. The mysterious race practice, the arts of agriculture, is proved by the fact that the mounds are so close together in some districts as to have rendered it impossible for the occupants to have subsisted by fishing and hunting. And that those inhabitants engaged in mining and commerce is proved by the discovery in Peruvian mounds of Lake Superior Copper. Again, we talked about the Lake Superior Copper, the Peruvians, um, a lot of interchange, <clears throat> exchange of trade has been proven quite extensively between all of these groups. Um, again, skipping ahead. Um Wooden temples and other structures that they were not of the same race as the Indians appears from the fact that the latter have no tradition concerning the origin of mounds, and were they the original mound builders, though their civilization subsequently perished, they could not have lost track of such an important part of the history of their race. Again, that's, you know, not always the case, but, but yeah. Um, and I was going to share, I can just summarize one more. When I mentioned earlier, I don't know if we were on air yet, but I talked about the Diabola or the Diablo mountain range or Devil's Mountain. Many of the tribes that we've mentioned here were aware of these mountains and they stayed well aware of them and said they were inhabited by devils. Um, a group of people were exploring these, and this is an article from 1887. And again, I'm paraphrasing. Um, the skull, so they found a body. The skull. Mount, Mount Diablo. Should, what should yeah. I pull up for reference? It, well, they call it Diabolo, but uh. it's also called Mount Diablo. Um, it's in northwest Texas. Okay. Thank the you. skull he found to it. be that of a man. The under jaw is of mammoth size easily receiving the head of an ordinary man. The teeth are enormous. The molars are enormous and have double rows of teeth. The surprise and gratification were great when he examined the vertebrae. It is of immense size, and the strange thing about it is that instead of terminating abruptly, as it does in an ordinary man, it is prolonged for 8 to 10 inches beyond describing a graceful curve to the wow. rear, like a tail. While the main vertebrae is firmly set, the caudal appendage is flexible, so it's flexible, and its juncture with the backbone proper at the usual location of the coccyx. It measures four and one-half inches wide, and it narrows rapidly toward the end. Considerable of the tail has disappeared, probably by decomposition, but sufficient remains to demonstrate beyond a doubt that at least the long-sought man with a tail has been found in the mysterious old cavern of northwest Texas. Mr. Osmer refuses all offers for his strange find and keeps it closely guarded in his cabin, allowing the curious visitor to see his old cliff-dwelling cliff friend at times. It should be seen by scientific men and examined, and perhaps the Darwinian theory will be forever established beyond even the shadow of a doubt. But yeah, so anyways, earlier in the article, and I, I did paraphrase it because it's a long one, but the, the, the skeleton was about eight feet tall. But yeah. Wow. With so, a tail. Eight feet tall with a skull so large it fit over the band's skull and double rows of teeth and a tail. Yeah. Jeez. And that's not like the only one. Obviously, I've found so many more of the double rows of teeth. This correlates a lot. You see a lot of, again, as we mentioned in our last talk, the, the six finger, six toes. Um, 
when it comes to mounds, the double rows of teeth thing and the six finger, six toes seem to kind of correlate. But yeah, so that's just, again, a tiny fraction. That's all the time permits for me. But uh, I'm just going to mute myself. And if you're still talking after the kids go to sleep, I'll sit back down. Could I just ask one question, Ben, before you go? Please, please. Have you ever um, used like an AI image generator and typed in some of these descriptions? Absolutely. These? I'll share so, my screen. Does it yeah. work? Yeah. Like when you were describing the armor and the, the glass encrusted weaponry and like these articles provide such rich descriptions and I, it's so visual. You here, know, I'd love here, to put see. This up. If it, put yeah. up my screen. Okay, so this is what yeah. I do for every episode. I make a thread. Right, and then I AI, I AI, I type in the title or a caption from the article, and I see what it makes. Yeah. So this is one that I didn't read because we didn't have time. But an ancient Aztec city beneath the soil of El Paso, they found a giant city of marble beneath El Paso, Texas. Beautiful. So this is kind of a theme that correlates with all of my anomalous America shows: is that all the cities we inhabit today are built on the ruins of an ancient city. Oh. And almost all the major cities, Houston, Austin, El Paso, Dallas, um, and the one I read about the flood, are the city built on a city. And the El Paso one's probably the most incredible. Uh, beneath the rubble of El Paso or the city of El Paso, they found a complete city built of white marble. So again, not to get off subject here, but yes, I take a, so this is the one I mentioned, the Galveston flood. Here's the image it gave me for the Galveston flood. Here's the one I mentioned about the weaponry, the shield with owls. This is what I made. Uh, here's the one about the pyramid with the petrified top. Here's the one I made for the skeleton in the cave. Wow. Here's one I didn't get to read, but this is about a temple that had all kinds of uh, Abyssian, Egyptian type hieroglyphics. Here's the one I made for the mound of skulls. Here's a drawing of one in Mexico that shows the obelisks that were covered in human skulls. Cool. Here's the Texas orangutan. <laughs> And then here's the one about the giant mining cities of northern Texas inhabited by millions of people. But there's Brilliant. a bunch. So Brilliant. I didn't even get a touch, a fraction of what I had. Um, wow. forest, forest turned to stone. This is a crazy one, and this was all mined. But they found tree stumps that are 100 and 150 feet tall. Tree stumps. Stumps. 150 foot tall. Tree stumps that were petrified turned into quartz. They found copper. They found quartz. They found gold. They found silver in all these trees. This is what I've shown, too, with with humans, human bodies, that in the right set of circumstances, the human body can be turned into all these elements. In fact, in California, they found giants that were turned into, like, silver and gold, and they found all kinds of minerals in them. Um, I have some of giants that have been turned into quartz. Um, but yeah, they found giant clams. This is one about clams. They were oh, giant clams. Someone <laughs> say my name. Yeah, someone huge. say my name. Oysters. I'm sorry. Oysters. I'm ready to put me in, coach. Um, <laughs> this is a petrified it's been woman. A clam theme. Oh. In a forest in uh, the Rio Grande area, they found a petrified woman. They thought it was a statue. Ooh. But then, upon further inspection, discovered it was a petrified woman. It was actually um, a du- actually a WNBA player at the time <laughs> who played for the Giant Clams. Yeah, the, this one's about uh, the previous ages of Texas, as we've described. Um, another petrified forest where they found giant trees and petrified uh, leaves that are absolutely gigantic. Um, wow. So again, we're looking at a higher oxygen higher more tropical climate but yeah so that's just a fraction anybody listening that's interested and wants to dig into this thread themselves they can just look up anomalous america or search that on my twitter page or watch the episode which i would appreciate number episode 10 texas fantastic episode but yeah they really all are each state that you've done is they're they're fantastic it's it's incredible what you found in there 
Thank you. So yeah, I'm gonna go put my kids to bed, and then if you're still at it, I'll sit back down. Sweet. Thanks, Ben. Yep. Good stuff. Wow. Hell yeah, man. I mean, just imagine the movies. I mean, if if, if there was a Hollywood level, you know, production company that was able to just pull up some of these newspaper articles, you know, a, a white marble city, you know, it's, it's just beautiful. They all sound incredible, just visually spectacular. Some of these creatures, some of these warriors and battles and weaponry, it could be, it could be great, obviously. And that's why we have superhero movies. And uh, that's why we have everything that we have right now. So that, um, Mm-hmm. If people think about these things, they go, oh, like Aquaman, right? With the trident. You know, it's a terrible uh, distortion of sure. how spectacular these things really are. Dylan, can I get your take on double rows of teeth? Because, you know, I think you have some Not interesting giants. takes um, on. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, different cast of people, different class of people, larger in stature most of the time that I've seen. Um, mm-hmm. So giants, man eaters, a lot of the time they've been they've been. Right. But were they man eaters to begin with, or were they pushed into being a man eater, or they called man eaters by their enemies? Whoa, so, here she comes. <laughs> She's a, man a lot of uh, yeah. There's a lot of different uh, angles to look at that from. But Fox Saga, there are giants. Um, they helped along the roadways and the travel ways. So it totally makes sense that they'd be all over North America. Um, travel ways because North America was a great exporter of metals. Copper is key. Copper into Europe and the Middle East coming from North America. So uh, something happened, some disconnect, and we get a prolifer- prol- proliferation of giants, double road teeth, people taking over. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm I'm looking down because I'm trying to pull up this article that someone sent me that was sick of double road teeth in Florida, double road teeth near the St. Johns County. Another interesting take, you know, we had uh, Kent Hovind, Doctor Kent Hovind, on the <laughs> channel uh, not too long ago. And he actually had some interesting theories, you know, coming from a whole wholly different perspective. So, you know, with take it with a grain of salt, but still can't be discounted quick, you know, too too quickly, is he said elongated skulls are simply older people. Now I have, you know, my issues with that, but there's something to this. Because a lot of these stories you hear about people living for hundreds of years or a thousand years old. You always hear about them getting a new set of teeth. Mm. Like these people who are living hundreds of years in um, in long life in Florida over there on one of these shelves right over there is it's known as uh, man's higher consciousness. Part of it also goes by the name long life in Florida. In that book, he lists all these, you know, historically recorded long lived people who were living hundreds of years and many of them would get a second row of teeth, Mm. not a second row. Sorry, I shouldn't say row, but they get a new set of teeth. Like, you know, we die at 70, 90, if you're lucky, you know, 100, if you're like, oh, get a call from the president, if you make 100. Pretty much what they say in the Old Testament, you know, lower down to 120s, like the real high end of human, human lifespan. Mm -hmm. We don't ever live long enough to get that second row of teeth. This is like, uh, you know, eagles and hawks. I'm pretty sure most like those raptors, birds of prey, they have to get a new beak. Many of them, they have to wait till their beak is gone, destroyed. Then they grow a new beak. Mm -hmm. So I think here's something, you know, I think people fix their teeth and die too soon. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you let your teeth kind of go and, and as you're in your old age, if you let them all go, 
you make way for the new set of teeth. And there's something to this. There's a historical basis for this. Go look it up. And Hilton Hotema, being someone who talks about it a lot, um, what if some of these double row teeth, I'm not saying they weren't vicious, disgusting, you know, like hybrid humans that had a taste for human flesh, that's very likely. But what if some of these double row teeth scenarios is older people living for hundreds of years, uninhibited by today's environment or whatever, you know, in a paradise time, who knows, simply who died in the middle of getting that second row of teeth. Does that make any sense? It does. That's mm. interesting take. Yeah, because yeah, he said the elongated skulls were simply people who lived continuously. of years. Now, you know, you've, you've got babies with elongated skulls in utero, which not only debunks the, the whole only artificial narrative, that they're all mm. artificial, but it also kind of challenges the Hovind theory that you have to be old to have an elongated skull, or at least the original elongated race did. But it's an interesting theory, <laughs> and he didn't talk about the double rows of teeth. I kind of filled in that gap, but we know that people get a second row of teeth, even third. Well, some of these guys live so long, they get new rows of teeth, new rows of teeth, or new sets of teeth, and the old ones are gone. But dying in the middle of that process, you might have two rows of teeth, you know, at one time. So. Jeez. Interesting. Hey, man. Imagine if, imagine if your girlfriend had two sets of, two rows of, two rows of teeth. <laughs> I like them teethy, boys. <laughs> I'm a, call me Nate, call me native, call me what you will, but uh, like a little, like a little tooth on. <laughs> <laughs> it, it reminds me of the Texas, um, Texas style Texas teeth the <laughs> the central you know when people get a central tooth just one tooth coming down through the roof tooth really like it, there's a word for that some people get it and it's uh, I guess revered in some cultures and there's some sort of spiritual uh, explanation for it I was looking it up um, or it could just be you know, GMO food mutations. Uh, but yeah, they, I think some people, maybe in India, they think if that happens, it's very sacred. Right. You know, the xenomorphs, I mean, just look at the xenomorphs. I think we're onto something here uh, from Alien. You've got, they're called aliens. They've got super elongated skulls, the aliens from Alien. And they have double rows of teeth. Mm. You know, it is fiction, but it is drawing it's, from, some, from something, you know. What do they call it? A, a soft release or something? Like, a, we're, we'll mm -hmm. tell you. Soft disclosure. Fiction. Soft disclosure, that's it. Yeah. Right. Well, that's a good point about the alien skull. Just pulling it up now. It's elongated. It looks like they're statues. It looks like all of those, uh, uh, those native, those Texas native statues i was pulling up earlier true the caddo and stuff true they all built their yeah. statues of like this the... this is what taino a lot of taino like caribbean native statues look like too with the heads more like cone-headed than uh how do you spell taino t a i space m mm. A, S, S, A, G, <laughs> E. <laughs> oh, whoops! I would have kept going. <laughs> I was, I was always there. Do I did that to some hot girl in high school who was taking notes off me one time? <laughs> Had her write some. What did the what, what did the teacher say? Give her some, some... Com complete BS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hyperdontia. This is interesting. Nar. That's it. Nar, you know this is up. Hyper what? This is the roof tooth that roof uh, tooth. he was talking about. Hyperdontia. Damn. What's up, yeah. Shoddy? 
What's up, there Shoddy? You, you give a little roof roof job. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Nice. That's pretty crazy. Is that like an egg tooth or like a egg cracking tooth? What's the function of that? Just a opening open pointless bottle. mutation. Yeah, it's probably a nut a nutcracker. <laughs> For uh, you know, before <laughs> the tools were invented. Right. Is that the same as a buck tooth, a tooth that's in front of the other? Oh. I, I pull up, if you Google hyperdontia, you're just going to get, I don't want photos. You know, I want a diagram or art made of it. But yeah. But, so you, you, know, know, the, you guys know about this? One sec, Jimmy. You know no. about this, that the Mongolian race does not get wisdom teeth? Have you heard about this? That a lot of Asian people don't get wisdom teeth. Have not. Yeah, let me look that up. I think it's Native Americans too. Wow. Forty-five percent of Inuit or Indigenous people have one less wisdom tooth. Uh, indigenous Mexican peoples have a 100% rate of not having wisdom teeth. Well, almost all European or African people do get a wisdom tooth, but wow. seems Native Americans, some Asian and Native American people do not get um, uh, wisdom teeth. Interesting. I'll pull my string. Yeah, very this interesting. Just be revering that extra teeth that comes in. So. That's that's basis for like different species and other animals. Mm -hmm. You know, have yeah. a different amount of teeth. That's a com completely different line of development. Yeah. And then why are they why are they called? Does anyone know the origin of why it's called wisdom teeth? Is that just because a... you get a little older when they come in? Oh yeah. You're a little wiser. That, that's what, at least what I think. The Didn't Steiner is. have some theory about teeth uh, measuring the the time that certain teeth come in? I went to a, a couple of Waldorf schools growing up, and there was something about only starting to teach certain things to children after certain teeth have had come in. Uh, like that's the marker. Like those are the milestones yeah. of yeah. age. And so he was very strict with that. He would, mm. he would, he would make sure that they only gave certain knowledge to children after they had developed certain teeth. Asian descent and the Inuit are least likely to have wisdom teeth. One hundred percent, ranging from practically zero wisdom teeth. So. Aboriginal Tasmanians, I guess, have it. They have a ton of wisdom teeth. They always get wisdom teeth. And then indigenous Mexicans do not get wisdom teeth. Hmm. And then... Oh, yeah, and they have different shaped teeth. This is another thing. If you look at the shapes of teeth, like the... If you look at a tooth from the bottom or from the top, they're shovel-shaped. Native Americans have shovel-shaped teeth, especially some of these mound builder people. Different shape to the teeth themselves, and a different number, and they don't get wisdom teeth. Approximately one-third of people are born without any, or never get them. Teeth shoveling. Look at that. Your, your Uber's here, Doctor, it seems. Yeah, I don't know. Some yeah. drunk loser sitting on their keys, <laughs> I think. Uh, this may shock you, but early Native Americans had a high fiber diet due to eating, due to heating large, I think they meant to say eating there, due to heating large amounts of corn, maize, 
bean, squash, fish, and game. This meant they also had healthy smiles to boot. Left them with very healthy teeth and gums. Dude, shut up, bro. <laughs> What was that book of the, the researcher who went to different islands and uh, studied different native peoples? And he put out this incredible book that showed, you know, pictures uh, probably in the 50s, 40s, 30s, something like that. And, you know, native people that just ate oh. what they caught and stuff. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That was, that was Shem's mom, I think, going around, <laughs> giving that in every, in every continent. <laughs> <laughs> World tour. <laughs> Shem's. Well, hang on. Shem's fictional character, fictional persona's mom. Yes. Not, not the not the doll who Shem actually is <laughs> inside. But um. Brutal. Yeah, she saw a lot. She saw a lot. She experienced a lot. You know. That's why he's so worldly. And yeah. there's a lot of wisdom that can be, yeah. you know, picked up along yeah. the way. What does Sam Hyde say? He got a dose of super cum. <laughs> like, like a when Used when your mom together. when your mom's been with like a, a million dudes, you just <laughs> get all their brain power together, if only. <laughs> but here, since we we're go. talking about since we we're talking about Texas earlier, oh, I think. I think Dylan's got to get going. Oh. All, good. All Gucci. Maybe he'll pop back in. Talk. Amelia Island. Fill, <laughs> fill the air. Fill the air. Um, De dead silence is... is well, I was just making it's, sure uh, that the beat... Guys, the, uh... keep it going. Conversation's <laughs> got to go. Dude, there's pygmies dropping dead left and right. Oh, keep yeah. Those, keep those dollars coming in. I mean, they, they're going to be wiped out, and they have the most beautiful teeth. That's the thing. Um, yeah. Pure diamonds. And so, you know, yep, there's, a, there's an ROI here. If we keep them alive, we can harvest them for their diamond teeth. That's where the rap <laughs> culture actually got it from True. um they they have natural diamond teeth and so they don't want you to know about that so then since we were talking about uh since we we're talking about elongated skulls double rows of teeth dylan mentioned elongated skulls in texas i thought we'd go back go through a little more now this is dig site in florida this is Amelia Island, Florida, up mm. near northeast Florida. That's right near Jekyll Island. That's uh, Tamukua territory, their ancestors, their predecessors. So they had elongated skulls right there. Big, long, egg-shaped crania um, buried like that in mounds, bogs. They had elongated skulls. In fact, in Anthropology of Florida by Alice Hardlicka, he mm -hmm. says that all or nearly all of the crania from Florida, nearly all the skeletal remains in Florida had cranial modification or some unusually shaped skull. Nearly all. That's pretty crazy. In most other cultures, it would be restricted to the lower, or sorry, the upper class. You know, the lower class wouldn't be allowed to shape their heads unless they were trying to pass yeah. into, into the upper class. How strict was the caste system, I guess, because it implies, because it's something the parents are doing to the, to the infant skull. So it, it implies that people jumped try, or they were aspirational with their children. They wanted to alleviate, you know, elevate yes. them in society. Also, kind of the, the other end of that, one way that you could get into the upper class in native Florida was to sacrifice your child to the chief. <laughs> Some Childs. things never change. <laughs> For real. 
that's like, hey, that's textbook. What do you mean? That's American society. Yeah. That's modern American society. Planned Sacrifice. Parenthood gets the first. Yep. And or Hollywood producers or something like that. Yeah. Fifteen year olds going into Planned Parenthood. That's not their yeah. third baby. It's that's, the first. Yes, their first usually. Planned Your Parenthood firstborn. gets all those firstborns that Moloch is just drooling for. Right. Yeah. Moloch yeah. Bell. It's like industrialized child sacrifice that's completely normal in, in oh, yeah. society. No, Planned, yeah. Parenthood no one's is, I. Planned Parenthood is child sacrifice. It is, it took the place, you know, these ancient races died out. Planned Parenthood took the place. Yeah. The Fe Federal Reserve was, was coined, planned, signed off on in the footprint of this, you know, uh, bloodthirsty, sacrificial tribe. But they need the engine to keep running. They need the gears to keep going. They need the cogs and the levers to, to stay lubricated with the mm -hmm. blood of the young and innocent. Yeah. That hasn't changed, no doubt. And they're doing that with Planned Parenthood. So think twice, guys. Be responsible out there. Only, right. only stick it in a girl that you're... <laughs> Just to speak it plainly, like your grandparents, only stick it in a chick you're willing to stay with forever. You know what I mean? That's your baby maker. That's no uh, no nonsense. It's not a mm. quick dispose, 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 you know, action, it's very, it's very important. And Moloch's hungry, you know, and the more Dude. that we feed him, does he oh. get, is, the more powerful he gets, obviously, and the more that we starve him, the weaker he gets. Dude, Moloch uh, just hit my audio with a, <laughs> yeah. with a scrambler device. He doesn't want us talking about this. Yeah, we're getting in the way of his dinner. Whatever, you guys <laughs> get it. I'm not, I'm not Ben Shapiro, you guys get it. Hopefully, most of you are, you know, conservative in this regard. It's not even a political yeah. thing. Are you for the? Are you for treating humans and babies like they're disposable, or are you not? Are you against treating babies like they're disposable? Right. Pretty plain and simple. Planned Parenthood. The first Planned Parenthood to open in Florida was Temecula Territory was in native oh. Temecula territory. No way. Modern times, but in the ancient territory of the Temecula. Pretty crazy. So that's, I, yeah. I was just looking up, apparently, did you know uh, when medical treatments were first introduced that come in a vial and have a point, pointy medical, uh, you know, treatments were first uh, brought out on the scene in the 1800s the popular backlash of the time was uh, the the rhetoric was don't do don't fall for this don't sacrifice your children to Moloch they would just say that in the really? the the society yeah there was there was writings about this newsletters and stuff like that and uh, you know th that was just common you know parlance of the time which is interesting. I'd love to see some of that. Yeah, I'm trying to find it. I've I've ma I've mainly heard it mentioned, and I've never seen a, a poster of it or something. But it was probably in essays in uh, literature, or so newspapers and stuff. But it, you know, people didn't like it. They, they didn't just take it. Uh, they didn't jump straight in at first. So we've gone through some of the, huh. Mr. Rock. Oh, there oh. he is. The old Rockefeller himself. The Rocky with his, Fella. Uh, with a nice entourage of teenagers here. This is his <laughs> this is his rap gang. Young money <laughs> young money squad. Oh, the Ohio boys. 
Yeah. That's, they all live uh, in that little shack behind. That's, that's where he little, keeps them. That's little pygmy on the left in the hat. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> young. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> Rocky ASAP Rocky. Young ASAP Rocky. That's good. That's uh, a that young where? young Canaanite right there. That's uh, that's a uh, Malaki Taki. That's Malak. Oh fuck, that's. Two rows. <laughs> this one just, just has two rows of teeth. We call them two rows. That's, that's Molaki six nine. Um, <laughs> terrible. Ricotta. <laughs> that's Lil Wayne May. <laughs> <laughs> Bad. Just just terrible. We're riffing here. Pretend the crowd's not even there. We're just yeah. Guys, we, we got to hone our craft in. That's right. The rap. The rap names. Brainstorming. But here, let me, I'm just going to skip to Texas so we can see some of these. I don't know if all these made it into the video. This is a skull from Texas. Look at that. Not the Very longest, long. not the longest, but definitely shaped, you know, think about, it's not that long, but think about how back it goes. It goes straight back. This guy has yeah. almost no forehead. And if you were to sit that thing down on its jaw, it would go straight back. They have it kind of tilting up right now. Oh. So it would be, yeah, completely um, horizontal. Mm -hmm. Probably very streamlined. You know, you see cyclists' helmets sort of go back sometimes. Yeah. Probably allowed for a lot of speed. There we go, Texas. That's East Texas. Coker Mound, I think that's up near Dallas. I could be wrong. That's a pretty big one. Pretty yeah. long. Harder to tell without the jaw on it. Mm -hmm. But here's another one right on the Louisiana border. This is not the elongated type. I forget what they call this one either. Occipital or orbital Out flattening. The sides. Yeah, pretty much getting the two, like, separate bulbous cavities in the back here really weird trippy you find this type in florida too you find it in peru but this is one of the rarer type one of the rarer shapes bilobe bilobe sometimes they were called oh jeez. this how long would they be in did they sleep like that a couple so of years they slept. yeah one year at least they, they all tend to say at first they were just when their heads were really soft they could just tie yeah like a cloth around it and shape it pretty softly i mean then to go to all this trouble they really they re like they really committed to this yeah, they really they, believed and they cared dude it's crazy it's almost like shaping your head was just an everyday part of life back then. Like this was just yeah. like a this was just like a malleable thing. Like different. I'm just uh, speculating here, but different occupations might have had different head shapes. You know, we know for mm -hmm. a fact that one tribe in South America and Florida they would shape the back of the head. They would be acting on the same part of the head that controls your vision. Them, uh, not, them not overtly knowing that, you know, medically, but intuitively, they, mm. they said, they, they even explained, we think this makes your vision better. And what if it does? This is the it thing. Probably did. If you I mean, if Jacob and the, the Rothschild gang and some of these wealthy uh, elite skulls that we find strangely elongated skulls what i mean that would be fascinating if we discovered that mm -hmm. it actually does improve certain elements of uh cognition yeah brain surgeons hate this one trick <laughs> <laughs> that's funny shawty give me head till i pass up shawty let the way that my flow is in whatever but uh new meaning to uh giving head right yeah it's, it's a big head long skulls 
elongated skull means something else on on the streets, right? There's got to be some. It's got to be in some rap lyrics. That'd be an interesting search. If elongated skulls have ever been wrapped, we're gonna make it, dude. Yeah, we're gonna make probably the, not the first sexual innuendo. It'll be the first elongated yeah. skulls. Oh yeah, guys, old world Florida rap album coming soon. <laughs> we're getting on that soon. We haven't started, but it's coming. That's why the you know funding the pygmies can actually help. Yep. Things like that happen because they're good workers, the pygmy, pygmies. We don't just get diamonds from, you know. They can, they can make things like that happen through funding. Through magic, yeah. Um, I hate to do this, but I'm probably going to have to bounce in a minute too. So All good. Gotta, we're at where's two, Dylan we're, at? We're at we two gotta, hours here. We can hop off. See, that's it's a good. huge one. That's, that looks like not just uh, reshaped, but that looks like puffed up. Like that yeah. looks way bigger than it should i don't i don't know the origin on this one yeah it says french on the left english on the right can't even read that down there but that's yakub that's, that's yakub that's yakub right this there yakub yeah pygmy pygmy life matters guys <laughs> yakub's a pygmy they're very intelligent So. And do you do you see? I mean, the fact that you've you've pulled up that clip of Florida State University, right? The doctor, we've yeah. got to try and get him on the show. Uh, oh, you know, sure. they're they're just talking about bone length, and they're coming out in a mainstream university, and they're admitting to this. Not so much in the skulls yet. They're not. They have they been allowed to go there yet? Well, the you skulls. Know? Just so you know, Jimmy, I know it's not like common knowledge, but just so you know, the elongated skulls, that's wide out in the open. They, right. they admit it. It's remarked upon in all, you know, the Florida, like archaeological literature. The only thing is that it's not talked about because a long time ago, like 1922, around there, maybe a little earlier, in the teens, what I referenced earlier, Alex Hardlicka wrote Anthropology of Florida. And in it, that was like the you know first concise official, official he was with the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. um, like record of what Florida was like, truly. And where this, this, you know, skeletal remains were like in Florida. He was the number one anti-giant guy, he wrote bunch of articles against giants saying oh no this is all fake it's just people picking up bones they don't know what they're doing they're not trained they miss mismeasure them you know they assume that they don't know where to place them when they compare them to their own body and he'd pull every every excuse out of the hat that he could to debunk giants even that guy had to admit in anthropology of florida that number one the bones in Florida are about twice as thick, robust, mm. dense than anywhere else in the world. Definitely Native Americans that, that in elsewhere, other parts of America, they're way thicker. Way thicker than European skulls, way thicker than Native American skulls. He said the thickest skulls in the world came from Florida. They had meaning the walls of the skull, not the size of the skull, like the walls yeah. of the bone were extra thick. Then he said, all, or what I said earlier, the majority of skeletal remains in Florida had elongated skulls. No need, yeah. you know, essentially saying, you don't need to remark on it, remark upon it anymore. Like it's a given that most of, the skeletons in Florida had elongated skulls. So yeah, it's 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 that's what I mean. In the mainstream universities, obviously, we all know elongated skulls exist because we can see them. That people are alive with them today. But are they saying? Are they able to admit that most of the skulls found were like this was the the culture? This was the the norm. I wonder. 
Yeah, they, they do. They say that about Florida. They don't say that right. about anywhere else that I've come across. So, you know, certain cultures definitely did it more than others. But even in, like, the Paracas or Inca cultures, South America, you didn't get everyone shaping their skulls. It was usually the royalty. It was usually mm -hmm. the religious caste. It was usually, you know, the uppers, upper caste. In Florida, from what I've read, it seems like almost everyone got it done. Yeah. Um, Jeez. That could be unique. It could be the ease of living that they had here. You know, more time to just kind of sit around and cosmetically alter themselves. Yeah. But um, just look at the differences in these shapes even. The guy on the bottom right, that's like a football head that just goes straight back. That thing's going to kill his neck. It's, it looks like he's wearing a reggae hat, one of those <laughs> like knitted uh, dread caps. I think, I think you hit it. I think you hit the nail on the, hit the, nail on the head <laughs> that this is, a Rasta. Like, this is a Rasta school. This is what we'll call yeah. these now from now on. Yeah. This is the Rasta Crania. The <laughs> Rasta right. It's uh, it's low as well. It's it just seems like you can actually fit a lot more brain in there. So the question is, is that what happens? You you make space for more brain, and does the brain grow larger? And you know, can you become a genius that way? Right. That's a question I'll probably have to leave on now. So I'm gonna bounce. Yeah. Yeah, we'll here we'll wrap it up right now all okay. together. Guys, thanks for joining. Go check out my Texas Forbidden History of Texas video. Just dropped at seven. Um go follow Ben. Stay tuned for what Dylan's gonna be up to. Go follow the archivist, Ben, waking up with analog. Stay tuned for what Dylan's gonna be up to. See him more on this channel. He's gonna be teaching some box saga stuff. Hopefully soon on his own, Sweet. his own uh, channel. But um, thanks, thanks for tuning in, guys. Chilling. Say hi to Jimmy. Say thanks to Jimmy. And um, yeah, go check out my Texas video. Then we're gonna be streaming on the third for the birthday, Florida's birthday. Birthday of Florida, Florida's. That's birthday. a big one. Yeah, yeah. and then there's a meetup. Is there a meetup coming up later in the? Yeah, meetup. We haven't we haven't made a poster Ooh. or flyer for it yet, but it's just whispers at the moment. March twenty fifth, I think, the full moon of yeah. March, full moon at the end of March. We're gonna do a meetup at Bach Tower. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a daytime meetup for now. We might try and plan something for night, but yeah. daytime meetup at Bach Tower. It's going to be amazing. Yep. I've never been. I've, I'm so excited to just visit it, but uh, a meetup would be ideal. Sweet. We're going to have a tour, talk about the history, mythology. Should be some other people there. We'll try and get Juan there. We might Sweet. try and get John Sachs, or we might try and get whoever else is nearby. But all right, guys, you know the deal. Have a good night. Thanks for tuning in. Peace.